and in fact gave rise to my appearing in the newspaper. Um, this project actually has a different objective to the NEA's uh, collection and reporting of data. Contrary to the uh, fact Dr. Dr. McMillan made, it was never my intention to uh, correct, replace, or audit, or even question the NEA's data. In fact, I am dependent upon their data. Uh, my objective is quite different. <coughs> my problem arises because I'm a runner. I run over, I exercise over distance. If you exercise in one place, if you on a tennis court or a football field, uh, if you can see or smell haze, then go inside. But if you run, as I do, uh, a 10k loop, or if you cycle a 30k loop, or if you paddle a 15k loop, uh, you face a very real possibility, if you're in borderline haze conditions, of going out running for an hour in no haze, and then sort of turning for home and being confronted by a wall of haze and an hour of ground to cover to get back home. And so the question for me was, um, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had closer to real time than at the time three-hourly data, and a much finer grain than just what fifths of Singapore, and so uh, you know, perhaps 50 or 60 sensors. So I looked into it a bit, and uh, you know, there's a few ways of measuring haze, or measuring particulate matter specifically. Uh, the amazingly expensive way, and uh, Dr. Valkyrie showed a picture of uh, a station running more or less these sensors, uh, actually captures uh, particulate matter for 24 hours, and you then weigh it, sort of micrograms, and work out the, the density of the air. It's very expensive, it's labor intensive, it's slow, but it's very accurate. Um, somewhat cheaper is the beta decay system. So this is actually running air through a um, piece of cloth strip and then putting it into a chamber with a beta radiation source and measuring how much beta radiation is absorbed. And that allows you to infer how much matter has been collected uh, in the tape during five minutes. Both of these are great. Uh, they are a solid basis for publishing data for medical, legal, and diplomatic purposes. And the NEA uses principally the one on the right, I suspect one or two on the left. On the left. However, these are all thousands, tens, or hundreds of thousands of dollars a piece, which, needless to say, I can't afford one of, let alone 50. So I took a different tack. I said, well, there are these really cheap dust sensors. Uh, they're about 12, 12 US dollars. Uh, they're used typically in air purifiers. They use an infrared beam uh, to count particles that are floating through the beam. They're not exact, they don't measure the whole of particular matter. Uh, and in fact, they're completely blind to most of the haze. They, they can only see things one micron and bigger. But my guess was that the haze has a fairly consistent composition. So if the one micron stuff is going up, then it's probably indicative of the haze going up at the same time. So uh, I put together a prototype uh, to work this way. Take the dust sensor, spark core, put them in a box, find a bunch of volunteers to stick them on their balconies, and use their, work, their Wi-Fi at home to send me a sample every 30 seconds, and to make the map that you saw at the beginning. Uh, the device itself looks like that. It's just a black box the size of your phone, but thicker. With some holes for air to come in and out. <coughs> in this case, it's sitting on the, the sheltered power that on a balcony on a condo. Um, the device inside is minimalism uh, at large. There's a photo diode, photo, sorry, an infrared LED on the right, which is emitting infrared. There's a photo diode up here at the left, uh, whose uh, current changes, the amount of light changes. And then the barrels are your lens, and then there's a resistor, which is a heater, which is creating the convection current to keep the air moving through it. And so as particles of dust, one micron or larger, uh, enter the sensor, the amount of current flowing through the photodiode dips. To get a sense of the, the optics, uh, the guy who put the chair down actually put a, an ordinary visible light LED in place of the photodiode, but they put the lens in, so you can see there's a focus just above the resistor. And so that's actually how what the it really is focused on what is traveling above the resistor. Uh, this was reversed, the same guy reverse engineered the schematic because the manufacturer doesn't. Um, the, the electronic geeks in the room might notice we use P1, probably have C at the bottom. The important fact is there's no feedback. So unlike reading a thermometer with an Arduino where you're reading an analog value, the output of this one's either on or off. And it's actually that it's uh, pulse width modulated. And so you're actually measuring how much of the time the output spends low. The more time it spends low, the more particles there are uh, breaking the beam and reducing the current through the photodiode. The manufacturer doesn't publish a formula, but this chart. Uh, so I found somebody else using it who had actually done a fitted curve, uh, which is that uh, second highlighted piece there, which is basically given the, uh, the ratio, the fraction of the time that the 
output of the sensor spins down, uh, what does that mean in terms of concentration? Conveniently, it's in particles per hundredth of a cubic foot, which is a, an amazingly convenient to measure. So, um, what the system delivers is a series of events using the Spark API, and so the key numbers are about the middle, the ones labeled C. Notice they do jump around a bit, uh, and so you do have to average more than one sample, but whether you do two minutes or five minutes is, is a, a choice you can make after the data has been gathered, rather than prejudging it with the device. And it's the basis for being able to make decisions about how close to real time the data is. Uh, I used a very crude linear approximation. It, it, the measurements from the data sensor do move with the NEA's data. That was my first indication that I was onto something that might actually work. Uh, but I do need to keep repeating people, this is an approximation, and a lot of the data is extrapolated. It's not something that replaces the, the expensive instruments. Uh, the outputs, in fact, I don't publish numbers. I mean, the, the data streams available to developers and the means of calculation is public. But in fact, in the map that I publish, it's just the five colors. And they're the same colors that the NEA uses for the five bands of PSI. And then they correspond approximately. Um, so this is great. Here we have a measurement, we have a thing, it's all great. Uh, there's one rather serious problem left, and it's humidity. And so it turns out that this method of measurement has a fundamental problem. If you look at the dates on those curves, it's been known about for a rather long time, that as the humidity in the air goes up, the amount of scattering uh, that occurs goes up drastically. And so you're reading numbers between 0% and about 60% relative humidity. This depends on the aerosol, but the detail, then it's all reading accurately. Once you get above 60%, this, the reading for the same concentration gets higher and higher and higher and higher, in this case up to tenfold, between 80 and 95%. And of course, in this country, the humidity spends most of its time in that range. And so there's a serious problem with the data coming out being more affected by how humid the air is than by how much haze there is. So this is a, an ongoing difficulty that needs addressing. Um, I won't go through that in detail, for time. So the big things that I learned out of this were, one, that the NEA is reasonably supportive. Um, when my project came to the attention of the newspapers, they approached me, uh, I was like, okay, for sure they've now spoken to the NEA. Uh, there was no interference of any kind. And in fact, uh, when I happened to meet him later at a gig camp, I think, as he, as, uh, but, sorry, Dr. Dr. question, he then connected me with the Chief Science Officer for Pollution Control. She is supportive, but she's a scientist, she's not an IT person and uh, the need to deal with IT people gets in the way of even the best of intentions, as I'm sure half the people in this room know. Most of us have been there. Um, another important lesson was that the Spark Core was too immature. If you're working with a device on your desktop that you're playing with, then a recently Kickstarter or crowdfunded uh, component is fine, but when you're deploying dozens of them to run unsupervised, places you can't easily get to for months or years, then pro little problems become major holiday network. So that was a, I like the device, I like the people, but that was a choice I wish I hadn't made, because uh, a couple of the issues with the maturity of the devices got in the way and I couldn't quickly fix them because of the way they were deployed. Uh, finding appropriate volunteers was difficult. 80% uh, of people in Singapore live in places that do not have balconies with power that's on them, and those that do are all in one part of the island, and consequently although I've got lots of people who want to help, uh, the correlation between them and where I'd like the census to be turned out to be very poor. But the really big discovery, was that the one micron proxy, the, the, inf the near infrared beam, is actually a modest uh, proxy for measuring the intensity of the haze in Singapore. Uh, I do get inquiries about other places, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, Beijing, for example, has a whole lot of stuff in its air that isn't haze. And so the, the correlation of the work that I've done is critically dependent upon what the air is made of. I have yet to have answers on whether that's viable elsewhere. Um, I'm starting to work on expanding the network into places where there are no apartments. I've been offered sites where there's no infrastructure, and I object strenuously to paying 10 or 20 bucks a month to telcos to send a very small amount of sensor data. So I've been looking at these Norwegian radio modules. Uh, I will talk about this in a conference session on the weekend. But uh, the magic number is the minus 1.8 dBm. Uh, that's about a thousand times as sensitive as the Wi Fi receiver in my <laughs> Lenovo meaning that, on paper, these things have a multi-kilometer range, despite operating entirely within the low-power device limits in the unlicensed spectrum. 
that if you can't get much data around, you can't web browse with it, but to move a few samples from sensors, you're talking about, I think these are $50. They're not expensive to us at all. They're like an inch long. Very, very small. So I'm working towards putting those in. I'll talk more about that on the weekend if you wish to hear about it. Um, so I've got 10 to 12 sensors operating now. I'd like to get to 50 or 60. How much time? Got the limit? Okay. Um, I have still failed to get the archival and live data feeds up and running, but I'll do those fairly soon and publish the back-end source. Um, but what I particularly want to do is add the humidity sensors, mesh modules, and also the battery and charger for solar power in other places. Um, in light of time, I will cover a lot of small detail in our conference session on the weekend. It will be on the board in uh, plugin. And I will also be doing a session on something a bit preposterous. Uh, for later this year, I tend to bounce radio signals off the moon. So <laughs> I will also do a talk on that on the weekend. Anyone who's into radio electronics uh, or long distance communications, this should be interesting. Thank you.